Hello everyone, thank you for joining me for this lecture. About financial mobile bankers. Um, and when I say mobile bankers, I actually mean Android bankers because we don't really see um, significant threats for iOS. So, <laughs> but don't worry, they will come for you too. So, a uh, little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Julia. I'm a researcher at the F5 research team. Uh, what I mostly do is reverse engineering of Windows and Android malware. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the mobile threat landscape, the main actors that we see in this threat landscape. Later on, I'll talk about the old tricks that we're familiar with that they employ, and also about new tricks that they have adopted from Windows malware and otherwise. So if we look at this timeline, we can see, although it started before 2013, the main actors right now uh, are Marcher, uh, which was first discovered in 2013, targeting Russia. In March 2014, it became a fully-fledged banking Trojan. Motherboard, first discovered in a fraudster forum ad in November 2015. Um, also, Guji malware, which was introduced later that year. And Bankbot, a year later, uh, was discovered, this uh, variant was discovered. And this year, 2017, we've seen some uh, threats, new threats we're going to talk about. And we're also looking forward to seeing new threats before this year ends. So, um, the old tricks. I'll start with SMS grabbing. So, mobile bankers were first used in conjunction with Windows banking trojans. Windows banking trojans were a very widespread, and the uh, uh, banking system had to find a way to fight them. And the way they fought in the browser um, attacks is sending a token to the user so that the, token, uh, so that the user uh, inserts this token in order to complete the transaction. And so the bank knows that this is actually the user committing the transaction and not the malware. And the, the fraudster had to come up with a solution for this. So um, they came up with mobile banking trojans uh, which were named after their Windows versions, like uh, Zitmo, Zeus in the mobile, Spitmo, SpyEye in the mobile, and they were downloaded by the user after being conned by WebInject to give away their phone numbers. So the user gave away their phone numbers, they got this SMS text, which is uh, asking them to download this APK. Afterwards, um, after they downloaded this APK, which was presented as an integral part in committing the transaction, um, they would commit the transaction on their web uh, banking page and the token that was sent to their device was stolen by the mobile banker that was already residing on their device. So nowadays, SMS grabbing capabilities can be found in standalone mobile malware types. They are used to steal the token sent by the bank in order to confirm a transaction. And the fraudster uses the token to complete the transaction he started after stealing the rest of the user's credentials from his mobile banking app. So nowadays, they don't really need the banking site uh, on the web. They can use the mobile uh, banking app to steal the credentials from there, and then their app will intercept the token and use it to complete the transaction. The most common way of stealing credentials among mobile banking trojans is using an overlay. This means that the malicious app waits in the background for the moment the user opens his or her online banking app. Once they do, the malware launches an app that looks exactly like the original banking application. The user inserts his or her banking credentials into the malicious app without suspecting a thing. So let's take a look at how this happens programmatically. What the malware is doing behind the scenes. So it wants to get the topmost activity. It wants to check, is uh, this activity uh, banking app activity? And if it is, it launches the fake login activity, which belongs to the malware, and uses it to steal the credentials of the unsuspecting user. This method has been in use for quite a while, since 2013. Google, being aware of this, has tried to deprecate the functionality that allows attackers to discover what is the topmost app, as well as overlaying other apps. However, both attackers 
and developers have been coming up with new ways of completing this task. So we're talking about the overlay attack vector and how it can be accomplished programmatically. So first, they used to use the get one uh, tasks. This was deprecated uh, at, in Lollipop. Later on, they used the get running app processes, which was again deprecated in Marshmallow. On Marshmallow, they started using the slash proc method. This method actually enumerates the pseudo files that represent processes in the Linux uh, operating system. And uh, using their properties, it is possible to tell which one is the topmost activity. But that was deprecated as well, and you can't use it in Nougat. But you can still use the accessibility service and the usage stats to do that. And there's a wonderful lecture about using the accessibility services from SkyCure. I really recommend it to see if it's interesting for you to find out how it's done. Uh, but both of those features uh, actually require uh, the user to, to be more involved and give them s certain permissions. So they're very much uh, conspicuous. So let's talk a little bit about the new tricks that malware had to employ in order to deal with this difficulty. So uh, the banking notification attack. What happens on the device is that the user uh, sees in the notification bar, he sees a notification which looks like a notification from the bank. It has the icon of the bank and it says you received a new message. So if we look at it carefully, we can see that the application name is Optus MMS. I don't know if you can see this, but it says Optus MMS. And this is obviously not the banking application. This is the malware uh, trying to trick the user into uh, clicking this. And the user thinks to himself, OK, this is obviously a message notification from my bank. I should probably click it. And then he clicks it. And what he gets is an activity, uh, a fake login activity, which looks exactly like the login of the bank. But it's actually an activity that belongs to the malware. Now, this attack factor is much more efficient than overlay for two reasons. It doesn't require waiting for the user to actually open the original banking app, and it doesn't require finding a way to get the topmost activity programmatically, because as we've seen, Google is really trying to fight hard on that front, and so it is very useful. And another attack vector is the SOX proxy. After the fraudsters steal the user's banking credentials, he or she still need to bypass the bank's server-side protections. Some security vendors keep track of user devices using fingerprinting. A unique signature for each user is created using their device info. If the fraudster tries to commit a transaction from his or her device, it will be detected as suspicious behavior. These fraudsters are using SOX proxy to overcome this obstacle. They are using the user's device as a network proxy. This way, the traffic from their device goes through the user's device before reaching the bank's server. The bank is tricked into thinking this traffic is coming from the real user and no malicious behavior is detected. <coughs> so, reflection. It's not a new method at all for hiding malicious intentions. We've seen it in the past. However, here we can see a usage very similar to Windows API obfuscation by Windows Trojans. Instead of calling system functions directly, the function name, class, and parameters are passed to a single routine that will invoke the function instead. As all the strings are also obfuscated, this can put a significant hindrance on research. So let's talk a little bit about Android plugins. This is something that's becoming very popular, especially this year, uh, among fraudsters. The most common and legitimate usage of plugins is logging in to multiple accounts simultaneously. For example, if I have a private Twitter account and a business Twitter account, and I want to look into both of them at the same time, I wouldn't be able to do it if I used the regular Twitter app. I'd have to install an app that runs two instances of Twitter as plugins, for example, Parallel Space, which is quite popular. And this technology is different from dynamic loading because it can load uh, or launch a whole APK, not just a DEX or JAR file. And there's no need to declare any specific interfaces or components for the loaded applications. Very convenient for fraudsters. It allows you to create a virtual space where you can install and run an APK. It doesn't require root. It is running on the local process. Um, well, as you said, it's super useful for fraudsters. 
um, because fraudsters want to launch their apps without installing and avoid declaring their apps components. And there are two types of fraud observed uh, in the wild which are abusing this technology. Um, two common frameworks for this are the virtual app and the Droid plugin, open source projects. So one way to abuse the plugin technology is to piggyback a legitimate looking app. The user installs a legitimate looking app that passes all the static security inspections successfully. In the assets of the legitimate app, there's an encrypted malicious payload, which will later on be decrypted and installed on the user's device. Once the application is launched, the malicious payload is decrypted and executed in the virtual space. In April, Android Malware Blog reported of Guji Financial Malware abusing this functionality in order to avoid AV detection, and he was using this framework, the specific framework we mentioned. If we look at this in this diagram, uh, the user sees a legitimate apps icon, um, Adobe Flash, okay, and then he presses the icon. At that moment, the application um, will uh, take the hidden APK from the assets, it will uh, decrypt it and install it on the user's device. It will then launch it and using the plugin framework and the malware will be running on the user's device. So this is one way. Another way to abuse this technology is having a malicious app running a legitimate app as a plugin. The malware poses as a dual instance app. This is a type of app that allow you to run several accounts simultaneously. There are a lot of them available on the Google Play Store. I don't think all of them are malicious, but um, there are a lot of options here in case you want to run several instances simultaneously. So the malware poses is one of those applications, and it's running a modified version of the social media app, for example, Twitter. It looks exactly like the real app. The difference is there are function hooks on functions such as get text or edit text or any network functions and which allow the malicious app to grab the credentials inserted into the social media app. First discovered in China and dubbed dual instance malware, this particular malware pretends to be a legitimate Twitter dual instance app. However, this trick can be used with any app that requires user credentials. For example, any banking app can be used in this way. So what actually happens is that we have this evil app which has the um, plugin framework, and it's using this plugin to launch the real Twitter application, but it also uses it in order to hook this Twitter application. So once the user inserts his or her credentials into this app, the hook, the function hook, will send these credentials straight to the command and control server belonging to the fraudster. Another attack vector, which we recently seen in all kinds of malware, is WebView. The WebView object uh, is commonly used, for example, for premium SMS um, sending, for like expensive, uh, expensive wall, uh, which was uh, explained in a blog by Checkpoint. Very interesting. Another usage is in DDoS malware, like Wirex, and we published in F5. We published a blog about this of this year, and click for the malware, like Judy or Plugin Phantom and Wirex in its previous um, version was also a click for the malware. So what's so interesting about this WebView object? For fraudsters, it's very easy to use it because it's sort of a browser inside your application. And you can instantiate as many as you like. It has a WebKit rendering engine. Uh, you can use it to, uh, it has uh, JavaScript capabilities, you can use it to intercept URL and, and inject Java objects into a page's JavaScript context, which actually means there's an actual bridge between the JavaScript running in the browser to the Java running in the app. This JavaScript, which is downloaded from the malicious server, can trigger in-app behavior in the job. So <laughs> this is very, very useful. And this method was actually used in expensive wall, uh, what we talked about before, in order to make the user uh, list the user to premium services without their knowledge using JavaScript. Let's take a closer look 
and the wire works smaller and how it does its DDoS attack. This function is actually the core of the malware. This is where all the fraud stuff happens. So if we take a closer look, we can see that it creates 100 instances of the WebView client in the for loop. When it creates this WebView instance, it changes the headers of the request. There is an X requested with header, which is sent by default, and it contains the name of the package. The fraudster doesn't want the name of the package to appear on the server, so he uh, will put an empty string instead. We can also see that while creating the web WebView instance, the malware will delete all the history and the cache from the user's device. This is done because uh, the processor doesn't want any resources to come from the user's cache. He wants everything he can to come from uh, all the resources to come from the server which he's attacking in order to create an overload. And here we can see that it loads the URL in order to attack the target. So, um, what we foresee in the future for all these types of malware uh, is going to continue adopting methods from Windows bankers because Windows bankers have been around for a while. They have, they're very mature. They have a lot of sophisticated methods and functionality. So, what we can adapt, what they can adapt to the mobile industry, why not? And they will continue trying to overcome Google's security enhancement, new features uh, that appear in new operating systems or uh, dep deprecated features, they need to overcome that. And also trying to bypass the Google Play Store, uh, to bypass the bouncer. And we know that there are a lot of malicious apps that are finding their way to the Play Store and finding a way to bypass the bouncer, actually. So, thank you very much. Any questions? So, Julia, really interesting, thank you. Um, I wonder, did you do any research about the uh, business ecosystem of these Trojans? For example, are the authors of these Trojans the same ones as the authors of the Windows Trojans? Are the ones of the, that find all the new tricks the ones that all wrote the previous Trojans? Is the payload the same? Are people selling them to each other? Are the Brazilians selling to the Russians and so on? But so if, you, if you can comment a bit about that. I'm not entirely familiar with that ecosystem. I, I know a, a lot of them come from Russia because we can see that they don't operate on Russian phones. So we know uh, that much. And we, we expect those are people who are not Windows developers originally, but people who actually do job for a living. <laughs> <laughs>